No prophet is without honor, except in his hometown, except among his kin, except with his relatives around, or hers, as the case may be. Ari Nowen was one of the great pastoral theologians of the last century. And Nowen was a Catholic priest, and he wrote about, about his expectations as he approached his ordination. He said, he said, I thought I would be the family priest. He said, I, I thought I would do all the marriages, that I would baptize the children, that I would help with the problems and keep the family close. But those expectations were not met. He went on to say, what I discovered was that the marriages didn't stay together. The children weren't baptized, or if they were, they didn't keep coming to church. And nobody came to me for any help. He said, these were good people, and I loved them. But I couldn't do anything for them. Jesus in the gospel is going to his hometown. And I suppose as he went there, because there was a buzz about his ministry, right? He'd been out, he'd been preaching, and he'd been curing people. And, and the word was that this young prophet had authority, he preached with authority. And he was amazing. And so he came to his own town, and he was invited to preach in the synagogue. This is, by the way, the last synagogue that Jesus will enter in Mark's gospel. The very last. And he gets up, and he reads, and he preaches, and we hear that the townspeople, the folks in the synagogue, the word in the translation were ast was astounded. The Greek word, expleso, means something like uh, amazed and perplexed at the same time. It's like, who's he? Who's he, this carpenter's son? And we know his mother and we know his family. Who is he to come back here and teach us like he's better than we are? Here you see the ugly other face of equality. The refusal to let somebody rise above the average. And so what the townspeople are saying to Jesus is we can't listen to you. You have nothing to tell us. And the word in Greek again is skandalane. You, we, we are scandal. You are a stumbling block for us. We don't get it. And then later on in the reading, we hear that Jesus himself is amazed, a different Greek word. And that means flabbergasted, surprised. Jesus couldn't understand as a human how these other people could reject him, but it was the pride. The pride of saying, he's not better than we are. William Butler Yeats, in his poem, The Four Sages, writes about what he calls a leveling spirit. A spirit that doesn't allow one to look out of the eyes of a poet or of a saint. We don't let people rise. Carl Jung, talking about our own personalities, says many of us suppress some of the best aspects of who we are because we don't want to be cut down by the people around us. So we, we repress into what Jung calls the shadow. Not only things we don't want to look, up, look at in ourselves, we put in our shadow the things that make us dangerous because they make us too good. And I think one of the challenges of this gospel 
is to free each other from that leveling spirit. What we see in Nazareth is the people there couldn't benefit from this great prophet. Jesus is the long-awaited one. He's the, he's the main event of history. But he was a stumbling block to them because he was nothing special in their eyes. How often do we reject what is marvelous around us because it comes through the medium of someone who seems to us not to be so special? Let me tell you this. There is no one who is not special in the eyes of God. And we should expect to hear the voice of God from the most unlikely places and through the mouths of the most unlikely people. And our humility, and we need to pray for that humility, must make us able to attend, to listen, to hear, and to allow our lives to be blessed by the God who never tires of blessing. But we get those blessings on God's terms and not on ours. And so this gospel calls for us to be attentive. Attentive to the best within ourselves. Let's not be afraid of, of those urges of generosity or brilliance that we find in ourselves. They're gifts from God. And those gifts are not given for you to just keep the lid on them. Your gifts are given to you to in turn give those gifts to others. We need to stop deciding that there, there are groups of people that can't speak to us because who are they? If we're young, sometimes we treat the old that way. If we're old, sometimes we treat the young that way. And we don't get to choose. God works through everyone. And so there's nothing that God surrounds us with that isn't filled with blessing if we allow ourselves to see it. Now, Jesus could have been defeated by this by this uh, event in his hometown. But he wasn't. He wasn't because he knew his mission. I think it was Mark Twain who said, there, the two most important days in a person's life are the day you're born and the day you know why you were born. Jesus knew why he was born. Jesus knew his mission. And so he would not be deterred. He left Nazareth and he, he anointed his 12 and sent them out, force multipliers. And they healed many sick people and they brought the message of repentance to others. And they advanced his work. And he went on to complete his mission on Calvary. We have also been born to do some great thing. And that great thing is great in God's eyes, even if it doesn't seem to be such, so important in our lives. You know, Patrick and Elizabeth in the back of the church there, they're holding some great thing. They're holding a little one-year-old. That is God's blessing. Every child is God's way of saying life goes on. And so, what is it that we need to go on and do? Every moment of our lives is charged with meaning. You don't have to be young. You don't have to be in the middle of life. If you're approaching your 81st year, for example, God is still saying, in every moment of that life, there is meaning and value. Find it and live it. Don't just think about it. Do something with it. That's what Nowen did. Nowen wasn't able to convert his family, 
but he went on to be a brilliant teacher of, of, of pastors. He wrote tens, 20, 30 books, maybe. Um, and towards the end of his life, he put his fabled academic career on hold, or maybe on ice. And he went and lived in a community of developmentally disabled people in Canada, L'Arche. And he found in those developmentally disabled people God's love, God's power, God's voice. These are the people we so easily ignore. They're the ones we so easily don't see. But now and saw them. And in them he saw the hand of God. So must we all look every day, every moment of our lives for the hand of God outstretched to bless and to caress us. Amen.